you either become a terrified creature or a terrifying creature. <laughs> you know, you can be either the one running from the, from the tiger or the tiger in a way. There aren't a ton of filmmakers, let alone genre filmmakers coming out of your region. What drew you to become a filmmaker? Oh my God, that's a big question in and of itself. I mean, like genre film should be so prevalent here. And we have like amazing people who make genre here. Like Joko Anvar is making amazing genre. You know, Timo is making amazing genre. And we have these crazy stories here, like crazy stories in Southeast Asia. I think that some of our beasts and monsters and like our folklore is way scarier than just some like sad, heartbroken lady in a transparent white dress wandering around like, <laughs> You know, like we got cannibals, we got mm -hmm. like a monster that eats your insides out. Um, that was nearly a Freudian slip too. <laughs> 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 Moving on. I think I find it fascinating that we don't have a lot more genre stories. And I, you know, we were talking a lot earlier about how um, things have gotten really rote and formulaic and people are like, oh, but this works. This is commercial. This mm -hmm. is what people want to watch. But if you keep doing that same old formula and that same old crap, then like after a while it doesn't work and then people don't want to watch that. So I think that, yeah, even though there aren't a lot of filmmakers here, much less genre filmmakers, we're in such a good position to be making genre film and something interesting that people might want to watch that's out of the box. I had no desire to become a filmmaker. I didn't know that it was a thing that you could just like do. Because, you know, when you watch, uh, when you look at those stories of like, oh, so-and-so went to Sundance, so-and-so is like making a multi-million dollar film, so-and-so is famous, she is the daughter of so-and-so Coppola, or he is like a really um, clever white boy who went to a very strategic school, or mm -hmm. I, I swear to God, this is what it sounds like to a non-film person. Ironically, like I fell, stumbled, just got tangled up with film completely unintentionally and somehow I'm on like my fifth feature produced and my third feature directed. <laughs> Yay, congratulations. Abnormal, but in a way I think it's a lot more fun when you when you come into it with no expectations, mm -hmm. do you know what I mean? I had a background as a ballet dancer mm -hmm. before I became a filmmaker. Everything that I do in film, everything that I draw from is from my ballet background. Mm -hmm. I mean, the hard work and the discipline that it takes to make one freaking film it makes me feel like a couple days at the studio mm -hmm. or in rehearsal <laughs> or ballet. I know that sounds so mean, but like similar feeling. The film that taught me how to make film was Black Swan. Mm -hmm. And I watched it because it was about ballet. And when I talked to him about it, he had said, um, you know, Swan Lake is essentially just a werewolf movie. Full moon comes out and then like girl turns into, well, actually the opposite, Swan turns into a girl. So she's like a reverse werewolf. There's so many weird genre stories in ballet and that's the first reason. Mm -hmm. The second is I'm Asian. We Asians like love ourselves the genre. Like it's real life for us. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, like, I'm sorry, this is like really, this is really blunt and pragmatic. People will read subtitles in a genre film. <laughs> they won't read subtitles in a regular film. Like, yeah. what do you mean? Horror, for several reasons, is A, more accessible when it comes to, like, on an international level because it's a genre that, like, fans seek out. So very mm -hmm. frequently people are like, oh, I saw this incredible, like, Thai horror movie, this Japanese yeah. horror movie, because, like, J-horror was so big in the States. Yeah. But also, like, out of all of them, it feels like the one that requires the least amount of pedigree to get into. Yeah, I have no pedigree. Ta-da! Yeah. <laughs> It's, it's it's the one that like doesn't care where you went to school. <laughs> what I've learned is because, you know, you don't need a pedigree to get into genre film. The people in genre film are like so kind. They're mm -hmm. so familial and nice. And there's such a community that like any time a problem arises or something happens, the genre filmmakers are like usually the first to like jump in and help mm -hmm. you solve your problem or help you in any way possible. It feels like sometimes you're like essentially shooting in like a jungle with like the scrappy little crew. What is the biggest difference between like making a film in a developing nation versus like what most film crews are used to here? I am making a film in a literal jungle 
with the scrappiest cowboy freaking crew that you will ever find. Like, first of all, the first difference is like um, the toilet situation is very different. <laughs> like, Gotta we do have it. toilets like in a walk in walking distance of our jungle set that we built, but when they weren't always functional or when they were all busy, like there were times that our team just had to go dig a hole deep in the woods. <laughs> It was a reality. We had elephants, baby elephants, visit our set and Aww. eat our bananas. Yes, apparently they love bananas. I didn't, you know, that's a thing. We are lacking a lot of equipment and a lot, a lot of people. So like, we weren't even 20 people, I want to say, on set. Not including the cast, of course, not including the the actors. And the art team was the largest because they had to build a set. They had to change the timelines. As you know, like the film has like multiple timelines. But my camera department had three people, which for me was huge, like mm -hmm. huge to have a camera department of three people because my last film had one and like a grip or a, a grip slash gaffer. It's like, we kind of have to do everything ourselves. Like you see, even my actors are trying to help with things. Like if they see like a cable needs to be put away or taken in, like you, uh, an actor might seriously run and do it. And you can never mm -hmm. do that in America. Besides like liability and insurance and et cetera, it's just like, this, there's a hierarchy that exists mm -hmm. in a Western film set that just doesn't exist on my set. There's no like, you don't speak to them because they're above you or you only speak to your key in your department. And that's very hard for Westerners to figure out because Westerners like live and die by the title. I like to tell people like, it's making a film on the worst camping trip of your life. And <laughs> I, I basically try to scare people away before they come because <laughs> I'm mother to babysit and I've been through mm -hmm. that by the way. I've definitely been through a Western film that I produced where it just was like, I am literally here to like babysit. And I don't need to hear people whining about, you know, we're in a third world country. We're in a developing country. Food is scarce. We don't have Starbucks. We don't have McDonald's. We don't, mm. I mean, what's the most basic thing people expect here? It's McDonald's and Starbucks, right? And we don't have any of Either those. Either of those we don't things. Have Subway. Yeah, we don't even have Subway. Do you feel like women on set are like expected to take these like maternal roles for the rest of the crew? Especially older women, yeah. Yeah. If you're an older woman, like there's this expectation that they're going to solve the problems. If they're going to, if there's a problem, if they're going to step in the middle and calm everyone down, but like, why should they, you know? We're all grown people on set. Like you should be able to solve your own problems. You shouldn't be creating problems. There shouldn't be any drama mm -hmm. on set. But one of the things that I've noticed that has improved a lot, Vanessa, is like just the dynamic between women in general. Mm -hmm. In the 10 years that I've been making film, I've noticed that before women felt really threatened for good reason, by the way, mm -hmm. like they were not treated well. Women felt really threatened and they felt like they had something to prove to be able to keep their place on set or to retain power. And so they always had to kind of like be extra. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Yeah. They always had to be some like power game. And there's a lot of sabotaging and backstabbing to keep their place and to yeah. stay on top of the rungs. Um, and I feel like that's really greatly reduced now. Do you think there's a reason why female filmmakers are drawn to horror? I think that for a lot of women, horror feels a lot more um, associative as a part of our daily lives. I bet a lot of people will think that this is super cliche, but I'm gonna f say it anyway. A lot of men don't feel scared to walk home alone at night. And women do because like, there is true horror in our lives. We get treated in our daily lives in a really horrific fashion to the point where we're almost like um, conditioned to believe that, oh, it's okay, that's just what happens to women. Yeah. You know, like, and so I think when women transition into making films and a lot of their films tend to be dark and tend to be horror oriented, that might be why. Like maybe it's like built into us, you know, mm -hmm. like that kind of dark tragedy is already like a massive part of our lives. And as women, I think we're super like super often we're expected to be strong in the face of tragedy there's death or there's divorce or you have children and shit goes wrong and it's like as the woman you're the one who's supposed to be the foundation of the house you're the yeah. one who's supposed to stay strong give everyone the emotional support even though you're like crumbling you know i think it's really easy for women to go into genre because of that that sort of root <laughs> 
perfect lead in. Um, what <laughs> scares you specifically? The more close to reality it is, mm -hmm. the more I'm scared. Like the kind of beast, like monster creature feature that scares me the most is anything that resembles humans, but like where the more you look at them, the more you realize that something is off. Things that are completely out of someone's control, that frightens me because I know what it's like to have things happen that you just have no control of. Mm -hmm. And to to stare death in the face and realize that there's nothing that you can do. People scare me. If you look, watch my films carefully, the villain is never the supernatural figure or the mm -hmm. creature or the monster. It's usually always people. Albeit, there is a project I'm working on now where it will be a creature feature. Um, and the creature should be pretty scary, but it's based off of a sex pat. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, a, a sex pat are like those nasty, gross, old, fat dudes that come to our region, to Southeast Asia, just for sex tourism. They, mm. they creep me out. And so I, one of the features that I'm working on next is an actual like sex pet creature monster. Can you tell me a little bit about your next project that you're working on? With the whole COVID situation, it's hard to say like what will be possible and what mm. will not be. I'm really lucky that I live in a country that's basically COVID free. Um, and so life is completely returned to normal for us. Mm -hmm. And so if I were to be able to shoot, it would be pretty fine except for the fact that it's we don't have flights coming in to our country mm -hmm. where our borders are closed and so like I'm not sure what the situation of filming is going to be for a while but if I can get my technicians here and if I can get my um, equipment here like we're ready to go I'm working on that sex pet creature feature which I call the white king because a lot of these white dudes come over and act like kings in our villages mm -hmm. here and I'm working on a love story afterwards. I but love I don't. That. This sounds so horrible. We have a lot of white people stories, like a lot, mm -hmm. a lot, a lot, a lot. And so much. A lot of them are really good. Don't worry. Don't worry, white folk. Like a lot of those <laughs> stories are really good. But like you know, like it's fine to change it up a bit and hear some of our other stories too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're also interesting. What more can be done to support international female filmmakers uh, and, and you know, give them the flowers that we give a lot of American female filmmakers? First of all, I'm going to tell you guys, like, it's a lot better now. I'm one of them, right? I'm one of those international female filmmakers. I feel like the whole world is my oyster now, and I feel ultra happy and lucky that people are now interested and that people now want to hear more diverse stories and they want to hear stories from women. After Parasite, they're like, oh, subtitles are not gonna kill me. Like, um, <laughs> and that people are looking for something different. I don't care really right now, right now, um, if it's 100% sincere or if it's some corporation trying to like tick a check mark, mm -hmm. and, you know, for diversity, like, hey, the door cracked open for me and I'm gonna put my goddamn foot in it while I still can. I admit, and maybe that's a little bit um, <clears throat> shrewd for me to say that, but for this, and the reason why I feel that like I'm gonna seize that moment, before this I had issues as a, as a filmmaker from um, overseas and being female. I travel with my teddy bear, <laughs> you know? like. <laughs> I talk about my puppies and my cats all the time. I wear cute sundresses. I have like, look, my nail is- Oh my God, it's a little cat. cat. I yeah. love it. And there are some people that don't take me seriously mm -hmm. because they're like, girl, cutesy. She's not a serious human being. Mm -hmm. She's not tough like a man. She's never going to be able to see a project to completion. She's probably emotional, mm -hmm. which I am not. I'm a cold, hard ass mother The second problem was me being foreign which I'm mm. not for. And I mean, as you may have noticed, like my English in ain't bad. Like it's really not bad. <laughs> yeah. People would see like the strange name, um, which is not strange. It's a very common last name in Vietnam. Um, people would see the strange name. They'd see like the, you know, not white skin, the tannish, brownish, yellowish skin, the black hair and brown eyes. And they would like assume that there was, I would have issues with the Western project right away. Like, I don't know what they thought. You know what, having a language barrier, which in English I do not have, does not prevent you from making a good film. Mm -hmm. Kiyoshi Kurosawa directed a film in France. <laughs> like, there are plenty of other people who are directing films that are not in their mother tongue language. But again, English is my mother tongue, so I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> 
insane to me when you think of just the time in between where it feels like it went from like no change, no change, no change to like all of a sudden that like that little crack is open, so to speak, that like little you bit that you can get your foot in the right door. Right. Yeah. It's rapid. It was rapid. Are there any female <clears throat> filmmakers, whether it be like from long ago or now that uh, you either like take inspiration from or you're just like a fan of in the horror genre? I respect my friend Isa so much. Isa Lopez, she is um, a Mexican filmmaker and she made this film called Tigers Are Not Afraid. Oh my God, that woman is such a fighter. Like she's such a fighter. And then she is so talented. She knows how to tell a story. She knows how to like form emotion mm -hmm. and pain and like cram it down your throat through the screen. She's incredible. And you know, like when I met her, I was stricken by how strong she was. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about a woman who has like a huge pedigree. She's done so much film and TV in Mexico um, prior to Tigers Are Not Afraid. But Tigers Are Not Afraid just happened to be the film that the Americans and the Western world, well, mm -hmm. she's Western too, she's, in, she's Mexican, but I mean like the Occidentals like recognized, you know? Yeah. And I just thought it was crazy because initially, it was kind of like under the radar. And then when it was picked up by Fantastic Fest and genre people started seeing it, genre people started talking about it. Then suddenly like it became this huge thing and people were like, oh, this this Mexican director who's a woman, like, oh, she's like this new talent. Like she's not a new talent. Mm -hmm. She's been talented since before you were around. You know? She's been around. Just cause you just she's heard of her doesn't and make her new. Amazing. What would you do if you had an unlimited budget? It's hard to say because if I had an unlimited budget, I still wouldn't feel comfortable like mm -hmm. throwing a shit ton of money down on one film because I'd be like, there's so many other awesome filmmakers where if we threw some of this money at them, like their films mm -hmm. would be also awesome. And that's my dream, by the way, is to be able to like make enough fat freaking film dough to be able to like produce a bunch of other amazingly talented new voices in film, not necessarily just young, but new voices in film. Mm -hmm. I want to make a cosmic horror ballet film. I want to bring my ballet back into, I want to bring my ballet back into play and I want to bring it with horror elements, some Lovecraftian um, elder god ballet mm -hmm. film. I, I hope that like listening to this, um, that the people who follow Nerdist feel like, feel like there's more to film that can be done too. Yeah. You know, I think that now that everyone's locked down at home in the Western world, um, they're watching so many films and there's mm -hmm. so much content that they're devouring. I hope they're watching films by women, films by people who aren't speaking English. And I hope that they're discovering like there's an entirely like new world of storytelling that doesn't just revolve around, um, I'm not gonna say what I said before, that doesn't just revolve around like the Western world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very one one voice that we're used to yeah yeah which like i said sometimes that voice is really great but sometimes you know we, we can hear other voices we can hear something different yeah <laughs> your initial background was you were initially studying archaeology and then eventually a transition was made into filmmaking what drove you to want to become a filmmaker i i grew up uh, um in a kind of a complicated environment because my mother died when I was very young and um, and I was um, a willful <sighs> little asshole I have to say probably you know <laughs> so I was not very liked mm -hmm. um, by other children and um, I, instead of listening to pop music which I love now but back then I didn't I I was obsessed with horror literature and Victorian characters and um, and horror films and mm -hmm. comic books and uh, and it was my refuge from from a world that seemed sometimes cruel and unexpected mm -hmm. and scary it's funny that I found in scary things a refuge from scary things. And one of the things that, that I loved were, were tales about lost civilizations when I was mm -hmm. very young. And then that came to me just uh, around the time that I watched Raiders of the Lost Ark. 
So it was, this is what I want to be, mm -hmm. you know, discovered lost cities and have adventures in the jungle. And, um, and then, you know, you make ideas about who you want to be. And, uh, and then I went into actual archaeology. And let me tell you, it was not what I expected. <laughs> <laughs> but then when I was confronted with the reality of day to day, uh, uh, measuring chemical composition in dirt from the 19th century, I was like, this is not my thing. This isn't the Ark of the Covenant. <laughs> you know, I want monsters and chases mm -hmm. and curses and uh, movies. At that point, there were only eight movies made per year in Mexico. It was mm -hmm. a really low point in, in production in Mexico. And those eight movies were made by the same eight old men. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> there was no chance to to work your way into that. But I was very lucky. I was right on the front line of A, the revival of commercial Mexican cinema, and uh, certainly of female writers and directors in, in this new era, of, or any era of Mexican cinema. Something you said specifically about like finding pop later in life, a lot of the women that I talked to in horror we all have the same foundation of like loving the macabre and the scary when we're very young and then kind of finding the poppy soft parts of us later. Why do you feel like horror is so appealing to women? When, when I came up with the title for Tigers Are Not Afraid, which is the actual original title, a lot of people think that because it was called Vuelven in Mexico, I said mm -hmm. Vuelven with an accent, Vuelven. In Mexico. <laughs> <laughs> no, the original title is Tigers Are Not Afraid, Los Tigres No Tienen Miedo. And, and that's kind of a philosophy that I discovered when I was very young, that a lot of things were terribly scary and things that made sense and made the world a good place to inhabit could disappear in a moment. I mm -hmm. learned that very early. So you either become a terrified creature or a terrifying creature. <laughs> you know, you can be either the one running from the, from the tiger or the tiger, in a way. Mm -hmm. So I think that embracing the scary and making it your own and becoming an expert in darkness mm -hmm. and in horror and in pain and in monsters and in all the scary things, there's a sense of making friends with the things that can destroy you. Yeah. And that takes you on a path of being scary and being powerful and being many things that you have to be because you're terrified. As you get actual real control as much as you can get of your life, you can allow yourself to have fun and to be silly and pink and all the things that you did not give yourself a chance to experience when you were younger. As, as a storyteller, is it appealing to you in exploring subjects like grief or, or, or heavier things? You know, it's just ingrained in who I am, mm -hmm. but possibly ingrained in who everyone is. And that's, I think, the recipe of telling stories that connect. Mm -hmm. When you find that by addressing your own as cars, you can illuminate somebody else's. You know, we're not that unique. <laughs> <laughs> pain is pain, human experience is yeah. human experience, loss is loss, yearning is yearning, we all know them. And that's why pop songs are so powerful, because they yep. just connect with something that we all understand. Mm. Weirdly enough, the, the physical translation of emotional pain is inextricable from actual physical pain many times. So when a monster tears someone's limbs apart in a movie, it's physically scary, but it, mm. if you connect that, the possibility of that happening, with an emo the possibility of, of an emotional pain, mm -hmm. it becomes A, a lot more relatable to everyone and to yourself. I've never had so far, and I hope it stays that way, a hand teared from me, you know? <laughs> but, yeah, um, no, 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 go with that's not my plans and that's not on my schedule this week. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that said, I know other types of pain and loss. And, uh, and I can use that experience to explore the fear we feel of, you know, getting our eyes, eaten by a dark creature of the night. 
one thing I was really excited to talk to you about, uh, in general, anything I've ever been excited to talk to just any other Latino about is how much of uh, Latino culture is telling each other ghost stories and 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 just an embrace of the the morbid and almost just like a matter of factness when it comes to death. Do you feel like that translates internationally? I do feel that uh, that it is central to yeah. the La Latino identity. It is central. Yeah. We are a culture that comes from the clash of two cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is obsessed with human sacrifices and has five different types of hell. <laughs> <You know? laughs> the other culture uh, adores um, this man who is nailed to a piece of wood mm -hmm. and bleeding in front of the congregation as a priest revives his flesh to feed it to the audience. So these two cultures collide in a very violent way. And what comes forward is Latino culture. Yeah. So, <laughs> so it's bound to be a washing blood and ghosts and, um, and uh, the voices of curses and mm -hmm. that magic thinking. As an anthropologist at some point, you get that feeling of how spiritual and how in love with ghost stories and the magical world we are. But mm -hmm. then you explore how magical thinking works in Africa or how magical thinking works in Asia. And you go into ghost stories in Japan and ghost stories in China mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, demons and curses all over the world. And you find that is it's human. Now, Western culture um, and Victorian culture mm -hmm. made a huge effort to suppress that side, the mainstream origin of American culture. Mm -hmm. But underneath that, what you have is a continent of Native Americans who have the same spiritual background as Native Americans had in, in the rest of the continent. And what you bring from Europe with that is, is people that come from Ireland and from Scotland. The Irish and the Scottish and the Welsh and the English themselves have a very rich spiritual crazy past. If you talk about ghosts that walk with you or curses that you receive, everyone around the world can hear mm -hmm. what you're saying. What types of horror tend to be most effective on you as, as, as an audience member? What, what do you find particularly scary? I'm particularly in, sensitive and curious about ghost stories. Mm -hmm. For me, ghosts are, you know, having had experience of losing someone and the possibility that death is not the final act <laughs> is, is, has always been incredibly thought-provoking for me. Mm. So ghosts are, have always been very fascinating. Whilst if you come to me and you say, it's a possession story, mm -hmm. I feel, and I love The Exorcist, but I feel that it's been done so many times in so many ways that you have to be incredibly smart to bring a new way to do it. And some people do. It's amazing how when you think that a genre has been beaten to death <laughs> still someone you know for me zombies for example and and we all know that the power of a zombie movie is not the zombies is what they bring in us yeah the ones that are not a zombie yet. the human element in the last 10 years is like really seriously one another zombie story and it's still it's amazing how every so often they come up with one that you go oh you know, it's yeah. still there. It's amazing. You know, the very same year that we got Twilight, we got uh, Let the Right One In. And that completely and absolutely revives the genre. For me, and I'm so happy that the shortlist for the Oscars was just announced. Mm -hmm. And among the, the movies shortlisted is La Llorona. An amazing movie, incredible movie. From personal experience, because at some point, of course, of course, like a Latina that is in horror and a woman, of course I was asked if I could come up with a take on La Llorona. Of course, everybody yeah. wants to do that. It has been done. It's very hard that it works. It's our and main story. And, but you know, for me it was like, I don't know how to tell this story in a way that I'm going to, I, I don't see anything there anymore. And along comes Jairo, and and he kills it. 
and he makes it alive. So honestly, any genre can deliver the goods still. That's why I just love horror, you know? My mother doesn't even watch any horror movies, but because she's Guatemalan, she will support any Guatemalan piece of media. <laughs> and she watched La Llorona and fell in love with it. She screamed, like, she dug her nails into my arm, but she <laughs> so, loved every second you know, of it. So, you know, as a Guatemalan woman, which mm -hmm. I'm not, but I've been to Guatemala, and, and we all know the stuff that has gone <sighs> To many uh, Central American, Central American countries, Guatemala yeah. is an exception, and the horrors there are insane. Yes, it's such a, an amazing way to go into both things. That I would think, how can you make a movie that is captivating, original about these two things? And he manages to do both. It's amazing. Are there any other uh, ghost stories that take place in Latin America that you've ever been curious about t uh, trying your hand at? I don't wanna, I don't wanna- um, Give away too much. Well, this, you know, it's no secret at all that I've been working for a long time um, with Guillermo del Toro in a mm -hmm. werewolf movie. Not until the last draft that I deliver of the script did I find a way to connect with the Mexican mythology of the Nahual, Mexican shapeshifter, mm -hmm. you know, how witches or brujos. So the idea of, of powerful witches or sorcerers having the ability of becoming another creature and transform mm -hmm. into them. It's not the center of the movie, but I took a lot of those elements and I put it in the mix. And I, I, I found in the latest drafts the possibility of bringing Mexican characters in a Western because mm -hmm. they've been throughout. And in the spaghetti Westerns, there was always the the, the Mexican. And, yeah. But I do feel that we still are missing the Mexican character in a Western. Yes. That, you know, that has that presence and responsibility because the relationship of between the US and Mexico and the moving of the border, mm -hmm. right as the Western was being conquered is right there to use for a story to go and use horror to tell that story I just everything just falls into place sometimes it's not part of the plan it just happens to come together earlier we were talking a little bit about how when you initially started working as a filmmaker most of what was coming out of Mexico were the same eight old men how from that point to now do you feel like the specifically the horror industry has evolved for female filmmakers when tigers opened which was 2017 it had a really long time of going uh through the festival circuit before it actually hit cinemas the distance between that and now um regarding women horror filmmakers is tremendous for three years, honestly, it's it's incredible. Mm -hmm. uh, when Jason Blum famously said, it's just that I, I want to work with women, but I don't feel that there's enough women horror filmmakers. And the internet revolted because there were a mm -hmm. bunch of names. And and I have to say, Jason, since then, has mm -hmm. he's working with, and he's doing everything he can to work with even more yeah. filmmakers. Not because it's the right thing, but because he sees that there is so much to say in that universe. Back when he said it, we all came up very quickly with a bunch of names. Yeah. Today that last would be so much longer. With yes. just a couple of years. It's amazing. There is a show you wrote on, which was, was it Laurentos de Pasión or? <laughs> yes, you got that right. Jesus, man, that was <laughs> too many years ago. <laughs> yeah, but I started my, my, my first job was writing and directing segments at um, Plaza Sesamo, which is mm -hmm. Sesame Street in Mexico. And uh, that was the first paid job I had. Uh, no, well, the second one, I was first assistant in a telenovela and I was fired because I was lousy. It was <laughs> terrible. I have so much respect for, for first assistants. I think it's the most difficult job in the world. Yeah, they're superheroes. <laughs> In the, in the entertainment world, I want to mm -hmm. say there's, you know, there's first line work, uh, the health yes. workers and, and but in, in, in our toy little world, mm -hmm. first assistant directors, they should take all the credits, all the credits for them. Third job was as a telenovela writer. And I was actually a ghost writer on that. You know, mm -hmm. my credit on that was school supervisor. 
Mm -hmm. But in reality, I wrote every damned word of every single episode. Every word of every episode I wrote. There was um, a storyline, right? That I would receive every day mm -hmm. that I didn't write. Which, now that I write everything from A to Z, let me tell you, it's a big thing to come yeah. up with a story. Turning that into scenes, I did every single one of them. My only credit was script supervisor, <laughs> which is insane. And uh, I didn't know I was tricked into that one until I saw the telenovela later when I was almost done with the job of writing. And I kind of revolted and, and, and the head writer said, honey, this is the way you have to pay your little piece of land. So next time you might get a credit. And I did. I went from there to writing my own telenovela and it was a hit, and then I retired. <laughs> so I was <laughs> done with them. <laughs> you know, deliver every day, I had to deliver one episode, every single day, which is 21 pages. They were half an hour episodes, 21 pages of content every 24 hours. And you develop some skills, mm -hmm. patience amongst them, you know, the will to write when there is no inspiration, And it doesn't matter if you're tired, sad, broke up, go through a divorce, you have to sit down and write. And you learn that. You, know, you learn how to do it. You learn the craft, definitely. What advice would you have now for women coming up in horror as the industry is becoming more open to female filmmakers and creatives? Be very careful of being used mm -hmm. because there is a need to to represent because it's the right thing and it's expected and that is that is a good thing that we're in a place where they just have to give us the jobs or we're yeah. gonna burn this down it's very simple yep. <laughs> they have to give us the jobs and that's amazing once you're there they still want to do the movies or the shows or the the way they would make them because that's what they're not afraid of. That's what they know connected in X or Y, you know. That's why every movie is pitched by, is this meets this, because that gives security. We've yeah. seen that before. There's no risk. Exactly. So once the risk is taken, which is hiring the woman, that happens, and that's amazing. There's going to be a big push of telling you how, how much, in what direction, or limiting your decisions and your freedom. And there's many ways to do that. The budget, time, how many drafts you have, how many cuts before it's taken. So it's very important to get out and get the jobs. Yes. It's also very, very important to hold on to the stories that you want to tell and tell them in the way you want to tell them. And the panic of maybe not finding a job tomorrow or maybe not getting the opportunity tomorrow. It's so hard to fight Yeah. while well, you're trying to hold on to what you need to say. And it's a delicate balance, you know? Because sometimes you have to negotiate and you have to do the movie that you have the chance to make to squeeze yourself and then take risks in the next mm -hmm. one. Be honest with yourself. Listen to your God. These are the most obvious Instagram philosophy things. <laughs> if they're true, yeah. listen to your God. And when you negotiate, be aware that it is a negotiation, which means you also win. Get away with yours, be careful. Those are, you know, that would be my, my piece of advice. The jobs are there, that's amazing. Yeah. It's how to get the job and then get the message. Once exactly. You the Trusting your gut is just advocating for you and who's going to advocate for you harder than you are? Nobody. Thank you so much. This was an amazing interview. You're fantastic. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. Thank you. It was very lovely and it was a lot of fun. I'm really, really happy with it.